My name is Jennifer Nagel. I teach philosophy at the University of Toronto. And today I want to talk to you about intuition. We'll talk about what makes a judgment count as intuitive. And we'll also talk about the role played by intuition in philosophy. Many philosophers over the centuries have recognized intuition as a way to gain knowledge, alongside other ways like perception, testimony, and explicit reasoning. English philosopher John Locke gives us a pretty standard way to map out the boundaries of intuition, so that's where we'll start. Locke contrasts intuition to sensory perception on one side and to demonstration on the other. Sensory perception, he notices, is always about particular things. You see this pizza in front of you right now. Maybe you see that this pizza is round. But we aren't restricted to making judgments about particular things. When we judge that no round things are square, we aren't just thinking about that particular pizza, but about a more general and abstract truth. Judging that circles are different from squares, according to Locke, is intuitive. And at least in this kind of case, where Locke thinks we're recognizing features of our ideas, intuition is a perfectly good source of knowledge. We know that no round things are square, through intuition. Locke also draws a contrast between intuition and demonstration. Intuition can tell us directly that a circle is not a triangle. But when we get to more complex questions, we need to use demonstration or explicit reasoning. So, for example, we can figure out that the interior angles of a triangle add up to two right angles. But we have to go through a series of steps to gain this knowledge, and that's demonstration. Demonstration requires conscious stages. Intuition is immediate. Locke notices that intuition and demonstration are connected, however. Each individual step in a chain of demonstrative reasoning is or at least should be, intuitive. Contemporary thinkers still draw a similar distinction, using a variety of labels for it. Psychologists draw contrasts between implicit versus explicit thinking, heuristic versus systematic, automatic versus controlled. It's been argued that these different labels are marking a common divide, and in the spirit of neutrality, the two sides are now often labeled type 1, and type 2 thinking. But you will also commonly see the type 1 side labeled intuitive and the type 2 side as reflective. The key difference between the two sides, according to leading psychologists like Keith Stanovich and Jonathan Evans, is exactly the difference that John Locke noticed. It's whether you have to go through a series of conscious steps. If I ask you to multiply 5 times 11, the answer, 55, probably comes to mind immediately and without effort, so that's intuitive for you. But if I ask you to divide 5 by 11, you probably have to go through a series of steps in doing the long division. That's reflection, not intuition at work. But notice that when you're doing that long division, it breaks down into a series of single-digit operations which are each intuitive. Intuition seems to tell us many things. And sometimes, when you make an intuitive judgment, you can go back and double-check it reflectively. Even if you naturally judge that 5 times 11 equals 55 intuitively, you can force yourself to think about it reflectively, going over the digits one at a time. So, intuition is immediate judgment, not necessarily in the sense that it's very fast, although it can be, but in the sense that it's not mediated by stages of thinking the way reflection is. Like reflection, intuition is a way of judging things that are abstract or amodal, not represented in any particular sensory modality, where vision can tell you about the colors of particular things, and hearing can tell you about sounds, Intuition can tell you about more abstract stuff, like geometry and numbers, and the kinds of things that matter in philosophy, like causation, justice, and knowledge. For example, intuitively, it seems wrong to harm an innocent person just for fun. Philosophers often test ideas against intuition. So, in Plato's dialogue, Theotetus, 
Socrates is asked whether knowledge is the same as true judgment, and he describes a scenario that intuitively illustrates the difference. In the scenario, a lawyer has to defend a client who's been accused of a violent crime. The client's actually innocent, but there are no eyewitnesses available. Given that he doesn't have any solid evidence to present, the lawyer knows the best strategy is not to try to teach the jury about what happened, but rather to use beautiful language to get the jury to like his client. The lawyer is charming, and the jury comes to believe correctly that this client is innocent. Socrates asks, do those jury members actually know that the defendant has not committed this crime? If your intuitions are like Plato's, you'll get the feeling they don't know, even though what they believe is true. Philosophers use intuitive scenarios like this one as evidence for general claims, like the claim that knowledge is something more than just true belief. Notice that it can take effort or sequential thinking to imagine the scenario but when you ask the key question about whether the jury members have knowledge, an answer just comes to you, and it may not be obvious to you why you get the feeling that you do. It's an interesting question where that kind of answer comes from. Notice that this video has so far defined intuition negatively. It isn't sensory perception, and it doesn't require conscious steps of reasoning. Philosophers have many different positive theories of how intuition works. Plato thought we were guided by our memory of the forms. Locke thought we were responding to features of our ideas. Some 20th century philosophers, like John Austin, argue that we're guided by our grasp of ordinary language, inheriting a history of learned distinctions that have passed the test of time. Still other philosophers take us to have a more direct grip on the nature of targets like knowledge and morality. Some think that intuitions in different areas are generated in different ways. Maybe some things become intuitive after we have rehearsed them. The multiplication example could be in this category. But in some areas, we seem to have intuitions about novel problems. Perhaps we're recognizing common patterns. And perhaps our instincts about morality work differently from our instincts about causation or knowledge. Some philosophers, they're called experimental philosophers, think that it's important to conduct formal studies of people's intuitions, rather than just reporting one's own armchair impressions. Philosophers with very different positive theories of intuition can agree that intuition is often a good way of making judgments, while allowing that it can sometimes fail and we can be led astray, either because intuition itself is imperfect or because we make a judgment which feels like an intuitive judgment but isn't really one. Something can seem intuitively right, and on reflection we can realize that we were mistaken. On some questions, different people may have different intuitions, and sometimes you can find that your own personal intuitions are in conflict with each other. Indeed, philosophical progress often begins when you have difficulty building a systematic and consistent theory that fits key intuitions. We have various paths open to us when our intuitions seem to be in conflict. We can find out about possible biases and perhaps discount some intuitions as natural cognitive illusions. We can defend a frankly counterintuitive theory on the basis of its theoretical virtues, like its simplicity. We may be able to train ourselves to have new intuitions in some cases. Finding out about conflict in our intuitions isn't necessarily a reason to be skeptical about intuition. We also have some conflict in our ordinary sensory perceptions. For example, we experience perceptual illusions, and we make observational errors. But there's enough common ground and consistency in what we perceive with our senses that a general attitude of trust in sensory perception seems well-founded, and we can work to correct for our mistakes and explain how they happened. It's an interesting question whether something parallel is possible in philosophy. When we tackle the project of building and defending a coherent theory of knowledge, morality, or some other philosophically interesting target, we're tackling something very difficult, 
that has been an ongoing project for centuries. So far, intuitions seem to have provided some valuable guidance in that kind of project. At least, it's very difficult to see how philosophy could start if it didn't consult intuitions at all. How far intuitions can ultimately take us remains to be seen.